Too Mickey, bro, as we say. Too Mickey. Too Mickey. What does Too Mickey mean? It's the equivalent of like awesome, essentially. Yeah. Too Mickey. Too Mickey. Yeah. Fuck yes. Then Too Mickey. Sure. So here we are. Where are we at right now? Currently in Kumu, <laughs> which is West Auckland, brother. Yeah. West Auckland, generally speaking, some people argue it's not West Auckland, but I don't know where they're getting their info from. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, bro, this is actually, uh, I've been here for about two months now, out west, and or even in the countryside in general, bro, so for me it's been like an epic transition. I'm closer to the west coast in terms of surf, main beaches are like Muriwai and Piha, which are just like magnificent zones you know what i mean if you've been there and yeah bro yeah welcome no my to my that means uh i hope you feel good here welcome to the fuddy or the house kia ora kia ora it's an epic space so let's start with your story we um we didn't start it at all because <laughs> we met it we met at kiwi burn middle of a dance floor with flames going off everywhere mm-hmm. and you taught me the proper pronunciation of a few words in te reo you taught me how to hongi properly mm. and uh we decided we'd meet up and do a podcast in the space of like i don't know probably five minutes um <laughs> yeah, yeah but yeah that's that's all i know and then i arrived here we've uh set up the podcast stuff but i don't know a lot about you man so What's your story? Yo, <laughs> man, sure for being here, bro. Obviously, you're the curator of uh, the corridor, the conversation. And um, yeah, man, I guess that question's always, it's like tricky to know where to start, but I'll, I'll do my best to move through it swiftly enough, but also not leave anything out. But um, so, bro, I grew up in Auckland, born and raised. My lineage is from Tuwhare Toa, which is the Taupo Tūrangi region in the middle of the North Island. So, Tuwhare Toa is my iwi, and Ngāti Te Maunga is my hapu, which is like a sub-tribe within the iwi. Um, so, we spent a lot of time down that way, but were raised on the North Shore in Auckland. When I say we, I've got six siblings, bro. <laughs> Five younger brothers, so I'm the oldest boy, and then my oldest sister, um, two of them who now have children, and I guess while I'm at it, I also have a son as well. So that's really cool to be um, engaged in terms of a, a parent in a situation where a lot of people around me are having children as well. That's just like an awesome unfolding there. Uh, my son's name is Ahiora, and it was pretty interesting naming him that in in the modern landscape you know and trying to figure out that fine line between a cow i really would like my son to have a name in te reo maori but which one is going to be most conducive to people who mostly speak english i guess an example of um where that can be tricky is the word wai is water in maori <clears throat> and there's quite a few names that have wai in it but if you're hearing wai through english ears it's it's why you know which is a mm. question which is an inquiry and so people who have that name an interesting thing about people with maori names that are on the trickier side to maybe pronounce or uh, or like that people change the name to be something a little more suitable so they'll either be like w or or they'll completely change it to an english name so that they can that's just a, that's a bit of a side tangent there, but yeah, my son's name Ahiora. Side tangents are, are all good. Just yeah, follow sweet. them all the way. They totally go. right. Flow. Stay I in had, the way. I've got a really good friend from. Um, I grew up in Kaiapoi, which is a, a town north of north of Christchurch, and um, and a good friend of mine. His name is Tiwano. So Tiwano. As you say, everyone calls him T, or T Bag. Actually, he ends up being his nickname. Yeah, yeah, similar kind of thing. Even though Tiwano is not difficult to pronounce. Sure, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, bro, that's, uh, I've encountered that a lot, so I had that in my mind when it came to naming my son. But man, I'm, I'm so happy with what we went with and his mother's Pākehā, 
I think I explained to you that that word Pākehā and broke it down, did I not? Can, yeah, can you please say yeah, it again? Yeah, yeah, totally, bro. So as someone who's half European, um, my father moved from England when he was about 13. So he's really identifies as Kiwi, you know. Um, and then my mother's Māori from quite a long, strong lineage of Māori, um, with a pretty quirky exception in the form of... Um, are you familiar with Wolfgang von Goethe? Rings a bell. Goethe, it's like G-O-E-T-H-E. Oh, like Goethe, like the German. Goethe, yeah, 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 exactly. So that lineage stems from uh, Wolfgang. Is it Wolfgang Maximilian von Goethe, or is it... I need to double check that, but the famous Shakespearean poet uh, of yeah. Germany yeah. Um, with that surname, he had three sons. Um, and so one of those sons ended up on an expedition and came to New Zealand and and uh, met and became the lover of a woman named Puhi Wahine, who was a Māori poetess oh, wow. and an artist and even very highly regarded in the Tuwharetō iwi. And so they uh, they had children, and so my lineage goes back to and deviates from that line. But interestingly enough, because the name Goethe in Germany was quite a prestigious and uh, they were careful with how they would genetically, uh, how do I say that, like a royal family, right? They've got their diligence about who is marrying in and mm. so on and getting the name. And so what they did is they... Um, I don't know if they necessarily uh, disowned the son who did that. However, they changed the spelling of it to G-O-T-T-Y mm. because New Zealanders couldn't say Goethe. They said Gotti because they said G-O-E-T-H-E and it became uh, Gotti and then the association was lost. But because us Māori are really, we really like to know where we're from and we keep track through um, what we call whakapapa. Whakapapa is your genealogy to your lineage and so you know I could certainly learn more of mine especially on my father's side I've been lucky enough to explore quite a bit of that which has been cool because it fundamentally contextualizes who you are you know mm. and so speaking to some of my older aunties who were telling me this they're like you know you you have German blood that lineates from like the, the Shakespeare of Germany so to speak and so it's like oh shit that's pretty cool and <laughs> yeah like, no wonder why some of my uncles who came from that line were, like, pianists and loved Mozart and were a little more uh, maybe extravagant or mm. peculiar and artistic fundamentally. Um, so, yeah, bro. Got a bit of that Goethe blood in me, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so I guess that summarizes to some degree going back f that, pr that far, um, yeah, who I am, where I'm from. Auckland, bro, Tamaki, Makoto, this is home for me on the whole. And then going down back to Whanganui, back to Taupo, Tūrangi, that's like, yeah, that's the ancestral home, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And did we actually define uh, just just like a process stuff as we go along? You're did we right. actually define Pākehā? Yeah, true, that was one. Like, I think one of us tangented it up. I totally broke my tangent. Whizzled out of control there. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, <laughs> Don't stress. Totally, bro. Now we're cool. Um, so, yeah, Pākehā, bro. I think the the pity with that word is it has sort of progressively gone into the box of a terminology that's not exactly nice or respectful. And so that's, you know, I think that only happens when there's a lack of understanding of the true meaning. Hence why overall in Te Māori, I'm trying my best to articulate it in English to give it justice for what it truly means, as opposed to losing a huge portion of the meaning through a lack of uh, an adequate explanation, maybe. Mm. So you the word Pākehā. So a pā is a, you may have heard the term a pā site. Mm -hmm. yep. Pā means the contact, so it's where we would set up shop, it's where we would build a whare nui. You know, a meeting house, a whare kai, a place that we eat. It would be our fortress, our pa. So that means contact. And then ha is a an onomatopoeic term that comes from the breath, which is literally just ha. You know, we breathe in and Māori say he. When we breathe out, it's ha. Mm. So ha is always associated with the breath. That ties into the word aroha as well. But aro meaning your present awareness. And 
and ha being your breath. We'll get to that. And so ke is the deviation of the word rereke, which means different. Rere is to fly. Ke is like from somewhere that they don't know. So rereke means like flowing in from unknown. Mm. It's the word we associate with different. And so if we look at the word pākehā, we have contact, ke, different, and ha is breath. So like I was saying to you on that dance floor while I was, you know, totally just glorified on ketamine and, and having a great experience. <laughs> um, that's what it means. And so when you know that, contact with a different breath or with a new breath, um, I think it totally takes it out of that category that could be, you know, considered demeaning or not respectful. So you're bro Pākehā. So I got Pākehā on me because my dad's European and and Māori as well. Um, which I, yeah, that's been interesting too because I learned the, I've been learning and continue to learn the history. And it's like this inner disposition or like this kind of disdain for the oppressors but a recognition as well, like far part of me is from that same line. So rather than, you know, knowing the history is useful. Unfortunately, it's not really taught very well in schools. So I've got a few things going on with some colleagues trying to bring in a bit more New Zealand and Māori history into the educational strata or sphere. Um, but yeah, learning about all of that was pretty hectic. Because it was um, highlighting to me how even though Māori are considered the global uh, cornerstone or representative for an indigenous race who was actually able to successfully, to a decent degree, integrate and merge, as you know about certain other indigenous peoples were, you know, genocidal type behavior and a lot of travesties that unfortunately as well aren't taught about because it's so ruthless and gory that how can you teach that to children? Mm. I kind of understand, but at the same time, in the same token, it's like maybe we're not doing justice if we're not telling the truth about how things happened. And admittingly, Māori did incredibly well, and I think there was a mutual respect and, and at a more literal, raw level was... The fact that once the sun went down, their guns, their muskets, their technology was rendered kind of useless. And because Māori were specialists in guerrilla warfare, trench warfare, distractive warfare, you know, the utilization of whistles to communicate and an ability to like bring it when they needed to, you know, Um, which I I always think back to those times, you know, on the battlefield, not necessarily just Māori against Pākehā because... As we know, who Māori or Māori war, mm. very common, bro. Yeah. But in saying that, maybe something that else that isn't understood is that there was a pretty sophisticated process of conversation, which we would call mihi, and and a meeting and a contact that would happen, and a lot of deliberating about whatever matters needed to be spoken on before it went to the point where it would be war. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes those would happen over and over and over again until they're like, we can't settle this discourse. Maybe one tribe wants to move in on another tribe's territory, which would affect the amount of kumara they had and the amount of protection that they had and so on. And that also ties into Māori fascination and uh, the work that they did around genetics and breeding. Or one thing they definitely did is they associated that unification of genes as like a permanent linking of family um and so that's why it was important that we knew where we were from because we Mm. could go back and figure out oh we have associations there and there and we all tie into this and this many generations ago this occurred where this chief came here made this agreement but to ultimately merge was to find your best warrior find their best or, I don't know, best is a very vague term, but strongest is more fastest or most acclaimed. And then they would mate to create, you know, a child that would bear the genetics of these two incredible specimens, so mm. to speak. Which was pretty cra- pretty crazy, eh? Mm. Yeah. Um, 
please just continue along any threads that arrive with you because I'm just enjoying being taken for the ride and learning about this. Um, cool. You you mentioned to me on the dance floor as well that there is ancient Maori knowledge and wisdom uh, and history, and then there's like the Catholic Maori yeah uh, sort of homogenization of the knowledge and of the language and of the wisdom as well um yeah could you elucidate a bit more of that totally bro and you know this topic in the maori sector i suppose as in on marae or with other maori is considered highly controversial because for obvious reasons right i mean i've done a lot of pondering and thinking as to trying to ascertain some positive elements of Māori shifting to Christianity to try and just formulate that transition in my head more to understand what really happened. But the more and more I go into it and, and learn, I suppose, the more I can see that it perhaps hard to even see if the, or know if it was um, intentional. But the result in the end, nonetheless, was a loss of much of the Māori spiritual, connective, understanding, relationship to the land, the earth, the elements, and shifted to be more God and Jesus and Christian focused, you know. And I have these conversations and run-ins with my mother, who's heavily Catholic. And I, I do my best to make sure it's a civil conversation and when I was younger, I guess I was way more savage. I was just, you know, the Bible was weaponized. It was brought in. It was We were brainwashed. We forgot where we were from. We forgot our deepest connections back through our whakapapa and all our prayers, our songs, our customs, our, th our habits became of the Christian doctrine. You know, what we wore, how we did ceremony, mimicked what they do in Rome. And no longer was, aside from the Māori language, Māori anymore. And the results of that, and what was most catastrophic, I suppose, was our tohunga, who were like our, our shaman, our direct connection to spirit. They were individuals within a tribe or even lot wider tribes and regions who were really tapped in and, most importantly, pertained all of the wisdom of the people who came before them through oration mm. so a downloading of all of the various prayers stories poems parables that were very much moldy very much formulated um independent of any other influence right so very very moldy passed down through generation to generation and story and and called it all in conversation and the talking of had a specific amount of that given to them and downloaded so unlike us having books or nowadays like technology that can store info it was literally generational wisdom i'll call it was in the minds of our tohunga and obviously he would then orate to the people but he ultimately pertained the encyclopedia mm -hmm. and the unique in, uh, blueprint and expression of that iwi specific to that iwi in those lineages mm. and at some point in time there was a it was something like the anti-tohunga act or the i think it was anti but it might have been a different word used but if you identified as a tohunga you were either incarcerated or um uh, killed basically and so very quickly the most spiritually acclaimed and connected individuals within any given tribe were outlawed. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, was a proper search put out to find them as well. So then they had to stop identifying as Tohunga if they wanted to preserve their own life and they're just another person in the tribe. And so the more of them that were found out and killed, you can imagine how how quickly diminished the connection to the ancestors through the minds of the individuals chosen to pertain mm. it all. It can quickly slip. And then as that's slipping, there's an introduction of a new way. Mm. The Bible, which in Māori is the paipera, 
and then all our karakia and prayers that were, um, I would say, more directed to what who Māori called iō, iō mātua kore, which is like, I guess it has a masculine presence and is the the great night, you know, the darkness beyond the stars, some form of a creator, but not necessarily personified like it is in Christianity mm. where, you know, growing up I had literally a picture of God in my in my mm. living room. Mm. And I used to say to my mum, like, that's a white guy with a beard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was like, the, it was the ultimate, it was the cardinal sin to yeah. say that. Yeah. But that was, and that was me at like 17 maybe. And then I started to realize like, oh man, if you look at the, the theme across time of how the Bible's missionaries and doctrine can be used to sort of like spiritually incarcerate slash separate. I won't say incarcerate because that's a harsh term. And I believe Christian values and and um, the very core light of all religions is a really pure thing. And there's a reason why it's withstood the test of time and survived. Not because it's been the most pressed by the oppressor as such, but also because it pertains a lot of incredible wisdom and teaching when it is understood correctly, you know, more of the metaphor, more of the archetype, more of the be like Jesus, don't follow Jesus type mm, conversation. Mm, mm. And yeah, bro. And so I was having all these experiences where I'd go to a marae and the prayers were just Catholic prayers and the songs were just like literally like English hymns translated to Māori. Mm. So it wasn't even Māori interpretative hymns of what the Christian values and s- a system meant to them. It was literal translation. And so very quickly in a few generations, brah, like Māori are Catholic now, mm. like across the board, mm. all of them. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. I've noticed that with karakia as well, that they're often, it's often just it's Catholic, Catholic prayers. In te reo, mm. from what, when I've seen the translations of a few of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Maybe I can also say that vibrationally, the prayer itself in the Māori language is still a beautiful expression. Mm. Do you know? Because, like, for example, e tō mātou mātou e te rangi, ki a tapu tō ingoa, ki a tai mai tō rangatiratanga. That's like an honorance, that's a Catholic prayer, prayer to God, but it's also, it's talking about how like we honor you, God, and we are devoted to you, and we admire your leadership. And so like, I won't, I wouldn't go as far as to say that the Māori translation of the Christian prayers are useless, because they still pertain the Christian wisdom through the Māori tongue. Mm. It's more like I find it unfortunate that we became so disconnected from Te Ao Tafito, the the time before mm. this all happened. And I guess the more I learned the history, you know, when you weren't allowed to speak Te Reo in schools and we started to truly merge as in like the people started to collectively be more in the frame of mind that Māori wasn't really that useful anymore and English was the language that could get you jobs and English was the language that could get you school. So over a relatively short period of time, it can all be mostly lost. And so now in my journey to rediscover any fragments of it, bro, you know, like through old books or most importantly through komatua, you know, elders. But then I find all the elders are Catholic, right? So I'm like... I feel like it's a bit of a, the search itself is, um, it's not easy because I don't, I wouldn't feel entirely comfortable to speak what I've been saying to a room full of Catholic Māori, you know, because Mm. even though I think they could agree with a part of what I'm saying, it's also stomping on the mana, so to speak, or the, um, the integrity and the, uh, identity identity of the people mm. even though I'm just trying to allude to what was there before mm. that doctrine came in and also the when you become the minority in any gene pool or situation 
naturally the majority will overrule. Mm. And I think that's what happened. And also, bro, I think Māori were like, fuck, it'd be nice not to kill each other anymore. Mm. Even though, like I said, there was a sophisticated process to get to a point where it's like, all right, warfare now, you know. Um, it was still a part of the Māori culture and we had concepts such as utu. Yeah, utu is a revenge, yeah. right? Yeah, bro. Yeah. And that was a raw thing that would expand, that would extend through generations. Mm. Because they knew the history too. They knew mm. that five generations ago, that tribe over there, who's not looking very powerful right now, took out one of our chiefs. Mm. May have even severed his head and eaten his brain mm. to gain his mana, to mm. absorb his ma tauranga, like his understanding. Hectic, bro. Mm. So within the new way, is non-violent. And, you know, there's church and there's eating Christ and the bread and drinking his blood, the wine, that kind of ritualistic aspect and here, so they could still there's something about being in a trance of prayer that's really like meditative and beautiful and I, I think at the very core Christianity to some degree did connect to the spiritual part of Māori mm. who would sing and pray and gather and give service and bow and kind of uh, yeah it just must have integrated to a point where they completely moved on from whatever was before and wholeheartedly embraced mm. Catholic and Christianity, yeah, which mm. is, I wouldn't, yeah. There's a there's an interesting layer on top of Christianity in the meme space that um, there's a philosoph French philosopher called René Girard who talks about mimesis um, and scapegoating and his thesis whether it's true or not but it's interesting to explore regardless is that um nearly all societies it, it can be a, a flat all the way out to an entire society or civilization you know in the macro and micro and larger scales yeah there ends up being this can end up being this perpetual cycle of um of mimetic violence um which ends up and scapegoating and this is why so many ancient civilizations and cultures had sacrifices you'd have um things would be going well for a while things would slowly get worse and worse and worse um you would one person would be singled out as the scapegoat the entire community would kill that person usually um i don't know if this happened in maori society but it definitely happened in, in many others um and then all the sins are absolved for the entire community and everyone's good for a while until it sort of happens again. And uh, Gerard's take on Christianity and Christ was that it was a psychotechnology to break the scapegoating cycle because rather than having a scapegoat in your community that's an actual person in the community, the scapegoat suddenly is Christ forever. So he's the scapegoat for everyone forever. He's a, he's died for everyone for all of your sins. So you don't need to scapegoat anyone anymore. And so it's um, true. His thesis is that Christianity was a sort of psychotechnology to reduce uh, an, an intra-tribal and interpersonal like intra-personal uh, intra-tribal not inter intra like within yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, violence and uh, and and murder and and just create more peaceful and uh, sustainable civilizations, which I find is like a really interesting uh, thesis um, on top of Christianity. Like a lot of people focus on the, you know, the new atheists focus on the fallacies within it. Um, the diff all the different schools of Christianity squabble each other about what's the real version and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. Um, other people focus on the, the uh, homophobia or the crusades is like so there's so many layers to to the different iterations of christianity um but yeah i think there are i agree there are some some really good virtuous parts of it um you know the the salvation army and all these charitable places in new zealand are still run by christian folks and they're doing often like thankless work and helping the community for very little money or no money you know mm -hmm. um They've always, you know, the Quakers are a really interesting group of Christians that have always been very, very helpful and very good in the community. And even in Utah and, and the States, the um, the Mormons apparently are just like lovely, lovely people, you know. Um, totally. Wacky beliefs, but lovely people. Yeah. But I think, uh, I think 
it is really is a, a true shame that um, it played out the way it did in such the oppressive way that it did and, and so much was lost and the synthesis wasn't done in a holistic way that retained a lot of a lot of the older knowledge and a lot of the older identity of the Maori people. That's, that's what I'm gathering from what you're saying. There was a synthesis yeah. and it was good on some levels, like especially, um, yeah, in the warfare level, it like totally basically stamped it out, right? Like if we're looking yeah. at modern day, modern day society in New Zealand, there's, there's no intertribal warfare anymore, right? There's still always violence in societies, but that's just society. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so so my question to you is how? What's the name for the for the shamans again? The tohunga, tohunga, uh, tohunga. Uh, yeah, I loosely say shaman. I'm like I'm into shamanism, and I love the idea of practitioners and sacred medicine and stuff. But Maori may argue that that's not the correct term. I mean, yeah, similar role, I suppose. Sure, though, right? yeah. Like that's, if we're just looking at it purely on a um, practical level of what they did. Yeah, you know, it's similar. To, I suppose to what a lot of sh- shamans did in other cultures. Yeah, so I would use shaman you... actually quite happily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, how would you? How does one find these tohunga that are around these days that have retained any sort of specs, specs of this ancient knowledge and like how are you piecing together this this stuff? Because you've told you told me at Kiwi Run that that's what you're doing, and I think that's incredible. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Totally, bro. I mean, I got a lot going on yeah. in the overall sense, but I definitely dedicate a part of my time and mind to not only the expansion of my own matauranga, like my Maori understanding, and um, for that question particularly, bro. People who are so in Maori, there's rongoa. Rongoa is the the god of peace or the feeling of peace and then ah is kind of the activation noun of that so rongo maori is like the maori healing modalities and there's um there's basically rongo which is the reference to the plant the particular native plant life of aotearoa and how to utilize all the different aspects of it and then you got midi midi which is a massage technique which is a very physical, deep tissue-esque um, thing that uh, was a tool for healing as well as rungwa, as well as the bush medicine was the massage. And then you have rumi rumi, which is more of the energetic uh, movement and transmutation and healing of energy um, with energy, less contact is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you also have like uh, tamoko, which is the tattooing. Mm. So all of these various branches of the tree of ho order, which is like well-being. Ho means wind, and order is the word we use for life, which directly translates as of the sun. Because ra, tamanui te ra is the embodiment. That's like the great sun father, but ra fundamentally means sun. So when we say kia ora, it's more like kia is the acknowledgement of the order within you, you know, mm-hmm. the acknowledgement of the life within you. Um, and so I suppose the people who pertain knowledge of rongoa, of ancient practices and how to use the various medicine and healing techniques, they're probably like the closest linked to that ancient wisdom because that in and of itself pertains a lot of that. There was no christian influx or um it didn't change the rongo practice mm. and even though it's rare like there are a lot of maori resurging and using rongo in the modern world and offering workshops and so on so it's definitely there it's prominent and the people who are at the at the forefront or the practitioners and the elders who are engaged with that stuff i would say they're the ones who are the best to kind of go to, speak with, and try to kind of dig a little deeper into the past and figure out some stuff. Um, so yeah, bro, I've I've definitely met a few key people along the way who have um, been able to give me fragments or a, or an opinion or allow my perspective to kind of 
run free and, and listen, you know, as opposed to getting immediately defensive. Because I've also had run-ins in a conversational context sharing my ideas about what I've just told you mm. and it be met with like quite a heavy resistance mm. and quite a like the attitude towards me is like you're being real disrespectful now to like a lot of people mm. and that's not a nice feeling and I don't mm. necessarily want to have that feeling or be in those situations and so for me it's been interesting just navigating like how do I respectfully approach an idea or an opinion a perspective and I think because I've grown to understand that there was a function served to some degree with the trans with um, the change in the transition to Christianity trying to ascertain what that is is tricky mm. but on the whole we did stop killing each other mm. we became devoted to something yeah but it's still I don't know man it's still kind of flawed too right because when you go from a sun worshipping, earth nurturing, uh, cultivators of food, geneticists, geneticists, warriors, orators, poets, performers, artists in the form of the Fokaito or the carving, you know, that was our mm. written form of word, bro. We didn't have letters and words. We had huge emblems and stones and we carved different tanifa or monsters or mythological depictions and koru you know these the cylindrical shape of the um the fern and all these i like to explore the idea and i don't necessarily have much evidence aside from a really interesting conversation i had with it or more practitioner i inquired about the understanding of mushrooms in maori mm. um, particularly psychoactive mushrooms mm. particularly cubensis and psilocybin and we have some beautiful native species here mm. that when the season comes, bro, they're everywhere. And so mm. I definitely think that not only was there a knowledge of the mushrooms of the New Zealand forest, but probably a deeply integrated relationship. Mm. Because when I look at the kōru, bro, when I look at Māori artwork, I feel like I'm getting a glimpse into some of the things that I bear witness to in a psychedelic experience, you know. Mm all different forms of psychedelics too but if I'm to think what was the most accessible in there fine so I like to explore that thinking of Māori called it hārori hārori were the mushrooms you know the fungal network of the native forest and I don't remember exactly how many native species we have of plant I know it's like a few thousand maybe I need to learn that more accurately but we have just as many fungal hmm. so if we have this definite, documented, expansive understanding of every little plant and how it works in the human system, um, you know, you, have you heard of kawakawa? I've heard of it, but I don't know its function. Or yeah, so the heart-shaped leaf, large green leaf, grows everywhere, bro. It was the cornerstone of Māori medicine, and it was the most profound antibacterial, antifungal, antibiotic and it was used in many ways, either as tea or in balms or to chew the raw leaf or to burn it to repel mosquitoes, to um, use it on damaged skin or cracked skin or for wound healing. Like, dude, it's a dream plant, you know. And um, that's the most, that plant grows everywhere and is probably the most prominent healing plant in the whole Māori medicine encyclopedia and then yeah we got all these mushrooms too so yeah i think there's like eight or nine native uh, psychoactive mushrooms look at that and there's yeah. obviously a, a whole bunch of others that aren't um psychoactive but are also you know edible properties, edible and yeah we've got a native medicinal. species of lion's mane and yeah, we've got all yeah. sorts of stuff bro so i guess what i'm saying is that alongside that influx of christian belief was probably a suppression or an exiling of especially those though that kind of knowledge you know psychedelic connection and ceremony and i definitely like that idea and think it's highly likely that maybe the tohunga would administer much like they would the koromiko or the kawakawa or bahutakawa leaf or or kōwhai, or manuka, all these medicines they had to like 
uh, create better stability and wellness across all dimensions in the individual. Um, I'm sure they use those as well, bro. Mm. Or had integration because, man. But the, the, those kind of medicines were pretty closely held as well by the by the elders and shamans and these kind of these kind of folks. Um, even in the Greek in the Greek civilization um, and a whole bunch of the other ones, they were yeah closely closely held. And if and the Christians eradicated it everywhere they they could. They even eradicated it in like in mainland Europe. In the beer, um, there used to be all these regional ales in Germany with all sorts of shit in them and, you know, herbs and God knows what else and the beer, you know, and the alcohol fermentation. Could have been all sorts of psychoactive stuff in there and they homogenized it, made the, um, made the like Pilsner kind of beer and the churches, churches sort of started taxing for that and, and homogenized it like basically killed all these regional ales. And in Greece, ancient Greece, um, the word for wine, or well, wine itself, was actually known as potions. They weren't known as wine. And everyone had different potion with different, again, different random shit in it. It would be alcoholic, but it fuck knows what else is in it. And you go, you know, try Xanos's, you know, to have his potions. They're real good. We had a great time. But don't don't try old Zeus's potions. They, <laughs> You know, you'll wake up three days later in the bloody random island, you know, with your pants down. So, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with you. It wouldn't be... It's definitely, definitely within the realms of possibility that that information was held and closely, closely held, and it's just gone. Um, but yeah, looking at those designs, looking at the 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 Maori art and yeah, the Koru and it's pretty psychedelic, you know. Um, yeah, would be interesting if there's any any kind of hints to that anywhere if it can be found. And maybe it will be found there. I don't know. Okay. Um, you mentioned that there's like uh, sort of a tricky a sort of um, it can be difficult to broach these subjects with the older people. And I've also encountered this with some friends of mine in Old Tatahi Christchurch where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Um, some people like yourself who are you know, part Pākehā, part Māori, and they, they're they trying to be a part of the synthesis. Like, because currently Aotearoa is in a synthesis period of try, trying to bring back Te Reo Māori and, 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 the, and the old knowledge and the culture and synthesize it with whatever the modern New Zealand Aotearoa culture is, which is still, again, another synthesis, synthesis of both. We've all, like, co-created this weird Kiwi totally Island culture right. thing. Totally, but the Kiwiana culture, unfortunately, is pretty, I don't know, what have we got, like, Jandals and Barbecues and, like, Dave Dobbin. And, you know, it's like, it's not, it isn't this deep, uh, no, no disrespect to Dave Dobbin, love, love Dave ah, Dobbin's got great, we love Fucking Dave. love Dave. Um, but, like, the Jandals and all this sort of stuff, it's not a deep. Fish and chips. Fish and chips, you know, it's not a Fill deep. Fill in the blank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, like, this deep cultural um, identity that reaches back down through language, through story, through myth through history back 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 to a long you know like most countries you go to overseas um i spend a lot of time in germany they have their language they've got their history they they have an identity you go to france you go to uh, i'm i'm quarter irish and ireland's got ancient history ancient mythology Same, bro, i'm about quarter irish there we go yeah, there yeah, we yeah. go um and you go in just about anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world but you know australia new zealand the united states um well the the mainstream culture of the united states yeah, the, the yeah, native sure. american people have a very ancient um history there and australia have a hundred thousand year old civilization that were there long long before um europeans arrived but it's we find ourselves in a tricky position now trying to synthesize something that's deep meaningful that resonates and that works for everybody because as i say people like yourself and friends of mine who are trying to do new things trying to synthesize new stuff are to their surprise and dismay are coming up to a lot of resistance not from the european like pakiha culture but from some of the older maori culture and that's the tricky thing um what would you like to see the synthesis become in new zealand like what would be what do you th- have you got a vision or have you had any ideas of what a good synthesis would be um, moving forward for us? 
Yeah, bro, I think I have, eh, if I try to summarize that. Um, it all starts with the education to our children. And I guess that resurgence or that now encouraged introduction of te reo Māori in schools is probably the like simplest and most effective way to transmute the the potency, the uniqueness and just the awesomeness of te reo Māori. Uh, through the kids, through song, fundamentally, right? Kids love to sing. Adults, we're a bit more thick skulled. We're harder to get through. And I mean, that's like an unfortunate statement. I wish we were like, we want to learn forever collectively and ultimately embrace it. Um, we just don't have the neuroplasticity. It's, 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 it's somewhat of an excuse, but it is true. Like, children can learn orders of magnitude more than we can and quicker and, 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 and wider breath than we can. That's totally. Just the way it is. And there's more of, the, you know, they've, they've got more imagination and there's more um, of like a, yeah, if it's fun, they'll do it, you know, and if it's engaging, they'll be involved and engaged. And so, yeah, bro, there's there's a lot that can happen across the board. I suppose any um, integration of te reo Māori, whether it's in your business or, I, I see there's, it's hard to, like identify between a company that truly wants to like integrate or just have like magnets on their fridge they mm. say like monday to friday and it's like how do we uh, there's such polarities bro like there's so there's such worlds apart in terms of ancient maori wisdom you know the 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 literally bro like the maori had what they called maramataka which is like the moon cycles there were many different phases within one moon cycle and each phase represented like uh, when they would plant food or when they would uh, do this or when they would go fish or when they shouldn't fish or when they would rest when, and when they would recover or when they would fight like it was all super integrated with celestial movements the moon phase they were obviously like really deeply in, integrated with astronomy and identification of matariki. You know, you probably heard of that. It's the Māori New Year. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. way more than that too. It's like when those stars are in a certain position, it's like, cool, let's take our kumara out. You know, <laughs> or like, cool, let's uh, put the seeds back in. Yeah. Or like, okay, now we need to move. Yeah. And so that today is like, it's hard to even fathom just how integrated with the environment in Aotearoa the Māori people were. Mm -hmm. It goes so deep and I guess our culture and current society is a level of superficiality that it thrives on and whether that's consumerism or overconsumption of bad quality info, TV, you name it, you fill in the blank. To create a synthesis between those two things, it seems like phew, how do we even achieve that? Like the mm -hmm. language is its own thing, don't get me mm -hmm. wrong, introducing the old kia ora, and, and some Māori translation, and bro, I think Māori should be so universal. I think if you're Pākehā or French or Māori or Aussie, man, like, there shouldn't be a barrier, even though there is, and people do often open up about that, and it has its roots and reasonings, but I encourage, like, anyone slash everyone to engage with te reo to whatever degree they would like to, you know? Mm. Is it just the language? Is it the tikanga? Is it the customs? Is it deeper than that? The astronomy, the prayer, the healing modalities? Is it even deeper than that? Like their mythology, their understanding of circumnavigation, canoeing, food growing, um, you know, you name it. It's kind of like, for me, I'm just like, okay, I need to explore the whole, the whole spectrum of te ao Māori and then do my best to position my understanding and myself in a place where I can truly teach people what I'm passionate about about te ao Māori you know and or it's, there's just so much to it that it's like alright well it's a big task at hand mm. and I think it starts with the language bro mm. probably like that's the very that's the most accessible thing that now we have apps we have Te Wananga or Aotearoa, bro, which mm. is literally like an educational facility that anyone can go do free Te Reo Māori courses. Really? Dude, wow. yeah. You didn't know? No. Yeah, bro. We'll see. That's right. You like, you're a connected person. You're online. You're in the 
mix, so to speak, but still like information like that that I just said isn't widely known, mm. therefore doesn't feel accessible and available. Then there's the overcoming of like maybe someone who is a bit shy who wants to learn Māori but is feeling like, oh man, like I'm going to walk into a room full of brown people or am I going to be the only white person? Mm. Or So every individual, I guess, has to overcome the various hurdles and resistances, whether they are actually Māori people giving them the vibe of like, you shouldn't be here, because that does happen too, mm. unfortunately, or it's just their own uh, interpretation of the culture and situation that makes it feel inaccessible to them. Mm. Yeah, I've heard people meet me and be like, man, like, so nice to meet someone Māori that's like trying to teach me shit, throwing Māori at me, giving me a hungi, mm. and like, I guess in my own little way, and whatever capacity I, through meeting people, through interaction, can just share on that level of like trying to make it feel really accessible and available and let people's curiosity take them on their journey to mm. yeah bro just taking it in and like look at the modern world look at the various flaws of how our societies operate and all the waste and all the overconsumption and pollution and so on while also recognizing we're in the most abundant prolifically incredible times of human history mm. that i also counterbalance that with that right because I fundamentally recognize, like, okay, this is the most abundant time that's ever been for humans, full stop, by an order of magnitude. And as you go back in history, it's like, well, they had no toilets and they didn't have fridges and most people were dirt poor, had mm -hmm. like a dollar a year. Now you look around, it's like, all right, we're prosperous. But there's a flaw to that prosperity and that consumption because where does it end? Where are those parameters? And how can we now connect to indigenous understanding mm. to counteract and balance it, right? Learning how to grow food, all of these things that most indigenous cultures could do very, very well and could exist for long periods of time. You know, you mentioned mm. the Aboriginal people, like hundreds, thousand years, they nomadically wandered and existed and lived off the land. And our society and cultures have only been going a fraction of that time and are already approaching some sort of impending doom perhaps or like an awakening to some sorts where we're like we've got to sort our shit out and maybe a lot of that sorting out of shit comes from a better understanding with indigenous knowledge fundamentally because it's all there yeah are you familiar with a fellow called tyson young kapoda nah bro all right I'll, I'll i'll get you a book from him he's um He's an indigenous Australian and a complex systems theorist. So he sits like right in foot in each camp. Whoa. Um, and he's got this incredible book called Sand Talk, which is like part part complex systems theory, part dream story, part like um, Aboriginal symbols, sand talk where they draw these symbols in the sand and tell you about land and story, part novel, part, you know, it's like a piece of art in this book. And... Um, I've spoken to him twice uh, and his he talks a lot about this as you were saying about how uh, indigenous people lived in such a way that they they weren't they didn't recognize a separateness from themselves and and nature and the planet and the animals and you know they may have known that they had a higher capacity but they are indistingu indistinguishable from the ecosystem that they're a part of. Um, agriculture comes, I mean, the Māori were agriculturalists, but somewhere in between, right? Somewhere between hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists. They had, they had kumara and they had all these they had crops, yeah, but they also hunted and stuff, and they moved around seasonally. Um, but when agriculture hit, and civilization really started kicking off that's when that's when like proper poverty kicked in that's when proper malnutrition kicked in proper disease kicked in proper large-scale horrific warfare kicked in and also uh according to, to tyson's thesis this is when narcissism started to properly take root and would be sort of a fundamental part of these systems. And that's why none of them lasted more than a few thousand years. So they only last a few thousand years and then they collapse and then they do a few thousand years and then they collapse. Uh, he said one of the primary functions of 
um, Australian Aboriginal society is to uh, is to f- detect narcissist narcissistic qualities and bring them down. Not completely eliminate them. You can't ever completely eliminate them, but to bring them down um, and integrate them again. And that's why that's he said that's one of the many reasons why Aboriginal uh, civilization lasted so long. Um, and we find ourselves at a point now where, yeah, you're right. There is this, um, you know, it comes down to even, it comes down to a lot of things. But w- one thing that I really pay a lot of attention to is aesthetics. Every single symbol, every single bit of architecture, every every brand, every bit of clothing, every bit of art, every business are all pointers towards a worldview, a way that whoever created that thing wants to see the world or the way that they see the world. Um, some of them are unconscious of it. They just create stuff. Some of it's emergent. Oh shit, we don't have hardly any money. So we just build whatever we can with whatever we've got. Some of it's very, um, very thought out. Like some of the modern architecture, which is just hideous is like thought out to be like that. And they mm. think it's good, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of it's amazing, yeah. but a lot of it's really terrible. Um, and, you can define what good aesthetics are and what aren't by whether they increase, are neutral to, or lower harm in the long term and well-being in the long term. Not just for humans, but for the entire environment and the planet. Because um, we're on this, on this, you know, green and blue rock in the middle of, as far as we know, like a vast expanse of, of empty dead space, there's probably other life like somewhere or in some other time. But as far as we can see, it's like nowhere near us. It might be some microbes if we're lucky. So look, we're where we are right now. And we have to keep this thing robust if we want to stick around. And we're not doing a very good job of that. We're slowly like cutting down all the forests and destroying the oceans and just extracting, 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 yeah, yeah, extracting. Yeah. So the synthesis is, I agree, it has to be somewhere where we, be, where we come back into relation with the land, come back into relation with the old knowledge, pay respect and integrate all of the different peoples and all the best values and, and wisdom and history of those peoples together um, into something new that pays due to all those things and aims toward that goal of long-term well-being, long-term uh, reduction and or you know as much as possible of harm and um, the way that I can you know like a really simplistic way that I can see that happening is through the land through regenerative agriculture in the land through like forest garden cities is the one that I love to see that's like my personal utopia and it's not a uh, a mono culture utopia a lot of these like old utopian ideals from the 70s and stuff it's like all these dome houses that look all exactly the same and it's just like this like really homogenized and they're all wearing these like one piece spacesuits or whatever yeah yeah yeah, it's like it's a utopian vision it's like no utopia needs to be pluralistic it needs to be completely completely diverse same way that an ecology in nature is right like totally you look at a rainforest that's not homogenistic in the slightest a pine fucking forest that's set up just to like cut lumber is like that's horrible yeah new zealand ancient native rainforest is like the multiplicity of species and mycelium and it's this amazing network circular circular ecosystem and we need to emulate that with with what we're doing and for example i live up in um i'm currently living in a flat in Kashmir in christchurch which is up on the hills and Kashmir is um it was it was uh, founded by this guy called I think his name uh, some some old lord and he loved he had, he named a lot of these places in Christchurch after Indian areas um, and Kashmir they anglicised to C H C A S H M E R E but it's K A in Indian but whatever yeah 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 um, but his, one of his things was, was to like retain a lot of the old trees and he planted a whole bunch of trees and 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 oversaw this whole project and it's gorgeous you're basically living in amongst the forest on that hill and there's not really there's like a few other spots like that in, in, in Christchurch but everywhere else is like these like square lawns with like wooden fences and like brick house and you've got your shitty lawn and you're like half dead garden <laughs> concrete yeah, everywhere yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that's just bad aesthetics it's functional 
But like, come on, like, what's better? You're living like in a forest where the birds wake you up every morning, where the mycelium and all the stuff's just emerging around your house, and you're just you're just embedded within that, and you can like support it. You can you can weed it and keep everything you know nice and happy and growing. Mm. Gives you meaning, gives you purpose, makes you feel like you're part of the land, and you're actually contributing to the well-being of the entire planet just in your own little plot. Or you're just gonna have this crappy little like square of lawn and then you're gonna spray weed spray around on the concrete and shit you know that's that's the contrast and um so it's a war of of aesthetics and um i think the synthesis of of ancient maori knowledge and and te reo maori and um and acknowledging the different peoples of new zealand in the plural uh, pluralistic manner is like that's what needs to happen and um i don't know how to go about it I think both um, of us, neither, no, neither of us know exactly how to go about it, but certainly aiming, you know. Yeah, bro. I think just through hearing you speak just then, it probably has something to do with Māori and responsible Māori, I'll say, as in Māori who have this understanding and know how to use land and and work the land and make the land pro- like provide for people is maybe like having more control over what New Zealand is doing um, with its land, right? Mm. And, man, there's some dirty secrets about our country, bro. Like, mm. I found out that a huge area of Tuwharetua, which is all pine, you'd like a lot of pine there, bro, and it's yuck. It's bad for the land. It's, like you say, it's just rows and rows of the same tree does not create biodiversity there's no birds in there bro it's, it's a weird desolate yeah money making factory yeah. you know what i mean yeah. and it's incredibly profitable yeah. it's um it, uh, you just plant it and you bugger off for 30 years and when you come back you're rich you know yeah. it air quotes brings employment which is what everyone talks about but no one talks about its devastating impact on the soil bro it's acidic just killed it seriously bro yeah. yeah like you can't plant anything else in that ground for like 10 years apparently before it's regulated and actually got nutrients because it's just yeah did you say acidic just before i think, I think that's isn't that what the pine needles that yeah. acidify the soil Sorry, yeah right. I, I don't know much about it but it's sort of no it's all good but i found out that all the pine or a large portion of it is owned by harvard university oh yeah do you know what i mean oh, so, yeah yeah because they I heard that they developed um, this like really specific type of pine that like grew really straight, and they like pioneered it here in New Zealand. It grows like perfectly straight, so it's yeah. like perfect for milling or whatever. True. Um, yeah, yeah. And like, I guess then, I think you can we can give them a bit of forgiveness that in the seventies or eighties or whatever when they were developing that stuff, that probably looked like sustainable stuff to them and it's better it's better than some stuff at least it's like sequestering carbon or whatever it's doing something totally and it builds but a lot of homes bro. yeah you know it what builds i mean a lot of you need you need wood you, you do know, need like, wood totally uh, you know it could be wood, and you don't you know you wouldn't really want to grow a native rainforest and cut that down for wood you know and kill all the birds exactly. and shit. <laughs> i guess yeah, i guess yeah. it's 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 you know but but i just see so much like beer farmland um or just like, yeah, with nothing on it, just like some sheep or whatever, or hardly any, anything, or just pine, and then there's just like no native forest. And I feel like the, the land in New Zealand should just be like mostly native forest. Totally. But, I mean, we are good compared to a lot of other countries. There's like massive national parks. Like we do a pretty good job, but, but on around the, whole, the cities, like the cities should just be like, the cities should be native forests. You know, totally. I reckon like, and that makes people are happier. People are much happier living in a, like with the birds, with the trees regulates the temperature keeps it cool keeps it moist you know there's a lot of work to be done but um but i'm hopeful like i've got i feel like you've got a fire in your in your belly for it i've got fire in my belly for it and i think a lot of people of our generation want to do stuff um and there's a lot of cool projects going on there's like um there's this uh game game b crowd who are trying to develop like governance and models of society that aren't zero sum games that are like you know um, non-rivalrous societies um and there's a bunch of and there's a bunch of the regenerative agriculture cats and there's a whole bunch of different iterations of those guys all around the globe 
trying out stuff and trying to figure out how to make it scalable and totally, out, yeah. out compete the older system so yeah i'm i'm yeah. hopeful i'm hopeful but um for sure bro for yeah. sure i've definitely not lost hope at all like i think it's just like interesting to find out that most of new zealand isn't owned by new zealand mm. that's a real trippy one because you're like hang on how much you know they're like you look at grids and you're like oh my god like so that color is what we own and that color is what we don't own and so like, yeah. so you're like oh, okay so we don't own most of our country right yeah and obviously the whole concept of ownership was what originally discombobulated maori because yeah. we we had our word kawanatanga which meant guardianship mm. in the mind of every maori when they heard that word they did not hear own uh. so when it was all signed given and translated kawanatanga meant ownership that was where a lot of the the issues came from was mm. that mistranslation like one word but that one word when it's separated in those two definitions are two different worlds mm. one world is that land is being taken bought sold and now owned so now but they can't go on it so there's a progressive funneling and shifting of tribal land and so on and look there's been a huge return on a lot of Maori land too so mm. there's a lot to be grateful for while also recognizing like fuck that that was a pretty um huge flaw in that mm. translative era that created this idea of ownership and then when you fast forward to now and you look at how much of new zealand that us as the government as the people own it's like a small portion of the whole sum mm. and um yeah, and then obviously, like, there's China, there's, like, Harvard University, this and that, who own just huge amounts and huge sections of dairy farms and pine. Mm. And so, because it gives them such a great financial return, but they have absolutely no connection to, like, the communities, the people, yeah, exactly. or the culture, yeah. that's where the issues come from. Because mm. if Māori retained a high degree of guardianship you know, kaitiaki tanga, kawana tanga over the land and had the right people in leadership and were basing it on all the core values from old, mm. then it probably wouldn't have slipped into such a deteriorative, over-dairy farmed, pine polluted mess. Mm. And like my parents are farmers, bro. Mm. Like they have a small farm, 10 acres with their animals and they're pretty, they're very low impact and quite regenerative as well, which mm. is awesome. And, but on the whole, farming is like most obviously devastating our environment. Mm. Like it's not even a secret anymore, bro. Like mm. 60 something odd percent of our rivers are undrinkable. Mm. And a few generations back, they were the most pristine, the cleanest, the most mineral rich water potentially on earth mm. or definitely up there in the highest quartile of purity mm. and mineral richness. Um, and so, yeah, bro, it's like, wow. I think a part of my purpose, too, is to use my voice and whatever I do know to just educate people. Yeah. Like, in simple shit like that. Like, I tell my cousins, I'm like, you know all that pine? Like, further than the eye can see pine? Like, huge thousands and thousands of hectares of pine? Like, we don't own that. And they're mm -hmm. like, hey, what do you mean? That's our land. I'm like, nah, bro. It's owned by like a... Uh, uni overseas like mm. a university a prestigious university I, and then it's like oh but it brings in jobs and that's the same conversation around dairy but it's like yeah but it's n unsustainable as fuck mm. and just like devastating to the land and the ecology mm. and even going back further than that like that used to be native forest and so not only is it bad for shit right now but there used to be like giants residing in there and mm. ancient mycelial bird networks that, you know, can you imagine like what it was like, bro? Like mm. back in the day to just be in the Ngahiri and you can still experience this if you go to the Uruwiras or if you go to the Waitakere Ranges, like, bro, it's, it's magic, bro. Like no predators, only birds, incredible bird song, like when missionaries first arrived there's all these diary accounts of it was deafening with birds yeah, yeah, yeah. like they couldn't actually hear anything there were yeah. just so many millions and millions of flocks of just tui and kiriru and you know and um 
yeah I'm optimistic bro I hope that New Zealand if I can become Prime Minister when I'm like 65 Fuck yeah <laughs> can, can actually become independent bro like yeah. I've read a fact that in Pukekohe which is a really there's a lot of growing that happens there a lot mm. of like tomatoes capsicums all these primary vegetables are grown in Pukekohe very relative to the North Island even it's like a small town mm. barely any space right mm. but if we were to plant Pukekohe in organic food of all descriptions and commit to that kind of infrastructure all of New Zealand could eat really high grade organic food for like maybe free if the government was good enough to us or at an incredibly subsidized affordable rate mm. but instead bro what's affordable bro fish and chips mcdonald's really terrible quality food mm. you know at the core of everything i do is is how water is wellness and that's at the core of everything the maori did fundamentally as well what water were you drinking you know they had a distinguishment between wai ora, living water and wai mate and the way that the north island is is that lake topol is in the middle which was seen as the heart of the stingray or the fish and Lake Topol was all the glacial water that was fed. And then it, its extremities or its veins of the fish were the, all the rivers, bro. The mighty Waikato, which is polluted now. And that's a huge river, bro. How do you pollute something that's like moving millions and millions of litres of water every minute, you know? you got to be pretty bad. you got to really mm. poison the soil to get that going. And it fed to the extremities and the closer to the coast the river the less mineral rich and valuable that water was so that was like dead water is what they would call mm. it so yeah man i mean you and i understand the value of water like for one of the first things i ask people is like what kind of water do you drink you know and they're like town and i'm like yeah don't do that anymore if you can they're like what do you mean i'm like well okay let, let's just like take a step back like what's the most fundamental nutrient for all of life that we know of they're like, um, like oxygen? I'm like, yeah, cool. So air, nice. Even more fundamental to that is perhaps light. But we won't get into that. That's a whole different thing. Mm. You got air. So, okay, we have an abundance of clean air, thank God. Mm. Maybe in the heart of Auckland, you're like, eh, mm. not ideal, but even there, relative to the world, clean yeah. air. Yeah. Tick that box. No one really has to worry about that. Awesome. Then next is water, right? Like one, two, three. After that's food. So it's like, okay, cool, like, what type of water are you drinking? And people are like, just tap, I think i got a filter in my tap. And it's like, okay, that's all good and well. But just so you know, like, that water's recycled, comes through pipes. It's completely devoid of any nutrient. Like, it will hydrate you. But it's actually got, f like, added things to kill bacteria like fluoride and chlorine. And in Ototahi, bro, they had the cleanest water of any city in the world, bro. Mm. Direct glacial, incredible water, which now, unfortunately, is not because there were some issues with the quake, cracked that's, pipes. That's like, it's like, uh, it depends where you are in the city. Some parts are chlorine, some parts aren't. So luckily, like, where I'm at, there's like, doesn't appear to be any chlorine. Awesome. So I just drank straight from the tap there, but... As you're saying, like the problem with filtering it, right, is you lose all the minerals. So it's like you yeah, it depends on the filter. Oh, true. Okay, yeah. However, I guess it's just like some some people I know who air quotes care about their wellness. They watch what they eat, they exercise, but the the whole water thing hasn't gone off in their head. Like mm. they just drink whatever's there. And I'm like, okay, like the water I have in there is water from a valley called the Aradimu Valley, which mm. runs. In and around and under West Auckland, it's it's about 750 feet down, and it's just, bro, that water's been filtering for millions of years through rocks. Like, it's mineral rich. It's naturally alkalized. As you know, disease thrives in acidic environments, so if people have processed diets, processed blah, blah, and are acidic, then disease, disease is going to thrive, you know. So alkalizing your body fundamentally is easy to do through water you drink. Um, so it's an added bonus, but you know, it's like arguably some of the best water we have on the planet and it's, I could pay like $15 for a 20 liter tank and I go through like once a week or one a week and it's like the best investment I've ever made in myself, period. Mm. And I've about five years in now where I don't really drink anything other than, mm. although 
I do have the odd bit of tap water if I need to and so on. But if I'm organized and I have my bottles with me, I don't need to do that. And so I've got a big green tick at the fundamental nutrient box. Mm. And some people don't consider that to be of the utmost importance. Mm. And it baffles me, eh? Like I got friends that are buying homes and I'm like, what kind of water is at the house? And they're like, <laughs> we don't know. It's, like we don't yeah. really care. Like it's a nice, got a nice deck. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're gonna live there forever, bro. You should at least make sure. Like, what is it? Tank? What is it? This? Like, mer, mer, mer. and they're like, we didn't really think about it, bro. I'm just like constantly baffled at how little attention people give to like their fundamental nutrient. Mm. So that's another way to, I guess, injecting those kind of or that kind of education which is like a no-brainer as well as like something to consider um because we're also fucking grateful and very blessed to have taps that have water come out of them yeah 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 so it's like miracle yeah great now it's like do you want to i guess i'm i'm talking in the realm of optimization yeah 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 if you want to optimize start there and then your food is next right and so um yeah i guess that was a bit of a tangent it's a great tangent yeah yeah hard Fuck yeah. Change your water, change your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'd like to um, perhaps maybe we could bring it to a close with you mentioned the Māori New Year, which is being considered as a public holiday. And like, I think that they said they're going to consider it in three or four years to give businesses time to like, to like get used to the idea because all the businesses are like, we don't need another holiday. But I think, yeah. what's the name of it? Matariki. Matariki. So I think it's a great idea because Waitangi Day is always bittersweet and it's like our main Māori holiday here in New Zealand and it's um, it's not particularly a celebratory day, at least not in the circles I'm in because there's always the, as you said, there's like the translation issues in the treaty which cause so much grief. So it's like, how do you want to celebrate that day? It's tricky. Um, yeah. Whereas... Matariki? Yeah, Matariki. Yeah. Matariki um, would be devoid of all political content, right? It's it's a celebration of the Maori New Year and the constellation of the three... Is it the three sisters? It's known, uh, seven sisters. Seven sisters yeah, known yeah, in other yeah. cultures. Um, and, yeah, could you tell tell me more about that, uh, that event and the constellation and the significance? Because... Um, Tyson talked about it a little bit, but you'll have more knowledge as he's he's Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I mean, particularly on Matariki, I I wouldn't feel entirely confident to give it its justice in yep. terms of the overall and the the depth side of it. Sure, I suppose it, it um, corresponded with a few important um, things for the Maori. I think it had something heavily to do with their crops yeah um i'm pretty sure it was a celebratory time and it had something to do with the cycle of a year or maybe their year that was perceived through their seasonal understandings and when things were right and wrong yeah um but yeah i guess it's just one of their many celestial landmarks that um would induce like celebration and and a recognition for them making it to a certain point yeah once again yeah through um the cycle yeah bro and through complete. obviously like pretty clear hardship like if you or i were out there in undies right now like yeah, yeah, anywhere yeah. in new zealand like, yeah. like oh shit this is for real bro like, yeah. this, ain't, <laughs> yeah. this ain't a picnic like yeah, 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 we're yeah. trying to survive out here yeah. you know and yeah. and the maori would have um the fire in their fuddy in their mara you know which the term is or ahi is fire but we have a term called tiahi karoa which is the flame that burns sustainably. Mm. And if you imagine, bro, in a marae, they might have a fire that's been going 300 years, bro. Oh, yes, I've heard Never that. gone out. Yeah. So that was, the, that was the life force of the tribe. You know, it was the warmth and it was the area where they gathered to cut a care and to hang and to sleep and, and they would keep it lit over generations. And whenever that fire went out, it meant that the life force of the tribe was, was, it, was done and they were either moving on or or done for so mm. yeah i guess um i guess tying and weaving into all of that is my furtherment in knowing where maori came from we have some symbology like the tiki 
which is a Mexican symbol or an Aztec symbol, I think more accurately. And so it's pretty clear that South America was probably the origin of the first navigators who ventured out. And then there's associations to like Southeast Asia and Singapore. And there's, um, I have a friend who's from, is it Singapore? Yeah, there's the native people of Singapore. Their language is like the same as Maori. Mm. So little little clues like that. We've obviously got the kumara. We've got the the way in which we um would make boats. What kind of sails we would use. What kind of different techniques we would use to make it. And so we have all this corresponding evidence to bring us back to that point. You know, so South American history and culture is so rich and. Um, symbolism and understanding and then obviously it eventuated as navigators and yeah bro it's pretty crazy to think that um, also interesting love Easter Island speak Te Reo Māori mm. so we got ties there like that's mm. their native language bro mm. I met some people thought they were Māori talking to them in Te Reo and they're like we're from Rapa Nui and I was like, where's that? They're like, Rapa Nui, Easter Island. And I was like, why are you <laughs> yeah. talking to me in Te Reo? They're like, we speak Te Reo there. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's the yeah. place of like global significance for its statues. And um, I'd love to go there one day too. Um, and then just to throw a little, another last stick in the works, it's we have Celtic style stone structures in Aotearoa too. Mm. And I think Māori are reluctant to even touch on it mm. because, again, it comes back to this, like, we know our history, we don't want to change it, which is a stupid uh, way of seeing the world, I think. Well, maybe that's harsh, but it's at least there's an ignorance to it of, like, hang on, we've got a wall there, bro. It looks pretty man-made. And, and, like, I thought that we didn't make stone things, so why not? investigate that and mm. so i would like to one day go or do a documentary or take a crew and investigate the various phenomena of new zealand and of um, whatever we know through the maori culture and tie that into j just the maori history and what we definitely know and migrational roots and so on but then tied into like hang on what are these other peculiar bones of um some giants were found in ragland and like crazy things have been discovered and celtic coins have been discovered by treasure seekers and and weaponry from different parts of the world and stuff and it's like oh my gosh like the history goes even more um just off on its own unique pathway and i guess um, there's so much more to be discovered mm, and mm. I hope that Māori can open themselves up to potential possibilities that don't necessarily correspond to their understanding of the history and mm. maybe there's some room for tweaking and better understanding but I don't even know where to begin with that other than going to the site, taking geologists there's even been like pyramids discovered in New Zealand and I'm a big believer and fan of Graham Hancock yeah yeah and so I'm like all obsessed with ancient civilizations and the existence of of one and so maybe New Zealand or Zealandia the bigger continent had some sort of uh, major significance for an advanced civilization and when we find these walls and these structures and these things that don't make sense or correspond it's like cool well it goes further into kind of the back. ancient human history so the, the more that archaeologists dig up and and like carbon date stuff the further back a lot of these things go like the aboriginal culture they said it was you know 40,000 then it's 50,000 now they think it's 100,000 and like yeah this keeps going further back eh? so my um one of my favorite ever stories is the Kontiki expedition you know the Kontiki expedition have you heard of that one um crazy norwegian fellas uh, I think it was in like the 50s or 60s, maybe even earlier. And one of them had the thesis that, yeah, the, the, the kumara, sweet potato, it's in Polynesia. There's no, it's like endemic to South America. There's no way in hell it could have floated to Polynesia and like seeded a plant. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah. no fucking way. It would, like, everyone knows that it would rot. Like, 
so he was saying that um, some of the indigenous people from South America made their way to Polynesia on a balsa wood raft. And all of his colleagues, like, ridiculed him and said, you, you know, there's no way all of the Polynesia was settled by Southeast Asia. Like, everyone knows that. There's no way it could have been from South America. So he said, fuck you, I'm going to prove it to you. And he got together three other crazy Norwegians. They went to South America. I can't remember the exact country. It might have been Peru. They got a balsa wood raft built to spec, like, without without using any modern materials, like, with vines and shit. They just bought, like, a like a ham radio thing with them. That's, like, the only bit of tech, tech they had, some fishing rods, some water and stuff. And they just set off, like, <laughs> trying to get to Polynesia. And they're, like, on the, on the open water on this, like, tiny balsa wood raft all sleeping on there. They said there's, like, flotillas of... They called them dolphins, but they're, they're sharks and fish just, like, following the, the raft along. Because when the ocean was just full of life, they yeah. put down a line and within 10 seconds you have a fish. And so they just survived off of fishing and catching rainwater. And um, they made it to Polynesia. What? They fucking made it to Polynesia. Holy shit. Yeah. And... Um, Another uh, spanner was thrown in the works because they did a bunch of genetic testing on Polynesians and they found that it was like pretty much all from Southeast Asia. But then later on, they found that a small percentage was from South America, like one one to two percent. So either the South Americans got there first and then the Southeast Asians got over and overtook them, or maybe the, they got there, you know, afterwards. And but either way, the Southeast Asians seems seem to have dominated. But they kept the Kumara, probably kept a bunch of other stuff. Who wow. knows what else? But totally. epic book. I highly recommend reading it. It's such Yo, a cracker it sounds read. Epic, bro. Yeah, it's not too long either, but it's an absolute yeah. cracker. My dad met um, the author. I think his name's Thor. Like it's Holy one, heck. Yeah, crazy name. Um, yeah, so a lot of stuff to be explored. Let's perhaps finish on maybe in a cyclical way on how we met yeah. and you taught me how to hongi properly can you can you explain the procedure and the meaning behind the hongi and also for people like this this podcast is a global audience so there might be people that don't know what a hongi is or, or yeah, aren't yeah. familiar with the term that'd be awesome totally bro so um yeah like touching back on the fact that maori were a warrior race and you know warfare was a normal part of of life and so to distinguish between friend or foe was quite an important ritualistic encounter, you know. So Māori, the entire Māori language is based around the breath. When you start to break it down, you start to see ha, that that onomatopoeia of breath, just ha, you know, that's everywhere. It's embedded, it's encoded, everything's centralised around it, which makes sense too, right? Because, like, without breath there is no life and... And so the hungi was, uh, this is kind of my estimation too, right? Like I'm just, when I do it and I feel it and I see what it is, it's like, all right, there's like a real unification where two individuals will literally press noses, foreheads will lightly touch. A lot of people, maybe they've been taught different, but it's okay, but press foreheads, but it's actually a pressing of the noses. There's a lot of jokes about Māori's having flat noses because they hungi a lot. And who knows, man? Maybe there was a little epigenetic <laughs> phenomenon there. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to say. But, um, yeah, so it's a pressing of the noses. It's the sharing of breath. And through that act, you could really, um, yeah, you, you knew, okay, friend, you know, whānau even, family. Mm. And so, yeah, bro, it's just one of those beautiful details of the Māori culture that... Um, I certainly know is like just a powerful tool to connect with people and um, it wasn't normal to hongi women and I'm not sure why but there's a lot of protocol in Te Ao Māori that has that distinguishment between the masculine and the feminine and for example when you walk onto a marae the women are at the back and the men are at the front and it's like men are protectors and you don't know how this is going to go down. So mm. keep our woman and our children at the back and they're protected. And it's important to hold on to these things. You know, we're definitely coming into a world and a social environment that's everything's kind of merging and we're trying to blur some lines and so on. And those are real sophisticated issues that we definitely <laughs> won't get into now at mm. the end. However, 
it had its purpose in Te Ao Māori. And so, yeah, bro, um, at the end of a pōwhiri, which is like a meeting, um, everyone would stand and be in a line. And essentially, every individual who participated or who was in the room would go through this snake-like motion and hungi every other individual. And so that would circle would come all the way back around until everyone in that room had essentially pressed noses, shared breath, and just, you know, boom, there they were, third eyes pressing as well, right there in the mix, intimate and close, and just like solid, you know. So the bonds were formed through the officiating act of a, of a hungi. So, yeah, bro, it was beautiful to to meet you there at the yeah. Kiwi Burn dance floor in that moment. And yeah. obviously Kiwi Burn, without going too much into that, was just such an incredible capsule for connection. And, dude, it felt like a hyperbolic time chamber where, <laughs> yeah. you know, like everything felt accelerated. And I, although I only met these people briefly and various characters in the Kiwi Burn festival, it was just like, wow. I made some awesome connections and I fundamentally feel this is one of them, bro. So yeah, shot for just hitting me up and just being like, you want to do a podcast? I was like, yeah, bro, I'm trying to do a podcast. It'd be cool to do one and get a feel. I mean, obviously it's a conversation fundamentally, but thanks for coming around, bro, and setting up. And it's felt really awesome and natural and I hope I don't talk too much. I don't know. Perfect. Yeah, Especially true, bro. Too true. Mickey. Too Mickey. Kia ora, bro. Kia ora, bro.